Okay, I'm going to show you how to create a class video or tutorial using Camtasia Studio. Now, you should have Camtasia Studio on your machine. And I'll go to All Programs, Camtasia Studio 7. This is actually version 7.1. And to record the screen, you go to Applications, and you want Camtasia Recorder. So now we have the recorder, and there it is. And let's go through how to set it up. Now you want to first set up what area of the screen you want to record. If you're conducting a lesson and you have many applications open, you'll probably record full screen. You can click on the arrow next to Custom which will open the custom menu and you can see a variety of options. Uh, let me just choose 1024 by 768 and you can see that that area of my screen is selected. Now I can, uh, if I want to change where that's located, I can use my buttons there or I can drag the crosshairs in the middle and move that screen around. If you're in class though and you do a lot on your machine or you are doing a tutorial, maybe you use several applications or you have it, your application full screen, I always use full screen. Uh, webcam, I strongly recommend you turn off the webcam if it's not already off. You can see there are different options. Uh, you need to know which webcam you have, so that is my webcam, but I'm going to turn it off. The reason you turn it off is basically the webcam, especially if you're using a laptop and it's affixed to your laptop, it's going to be a picture of your head. And all you're going to do is increase the size of your recording dramatically, and people are just going to see your head go blah, 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 blah. Not real fun. Audio. You definitely want your microphone on because you are going to be talking. So let's click on the audio arrow button there. There we go. And make sure you know which microphone you're using. I know that Microphone Real Tech High Definition Audio is the correct one. And make sure. Now, if you want to record what the computer noise is from within the computer, you will also check Record System Audio. There are some options which we can click on and let's go through them. Let's start with the general menu. Um, you'll notice I, a lot of these are the default options checked. Show tool tips, warn me when the recorder will be recorded. Uh, it gives you a little three, two, one. Um, capture layered windows, which is if you're going back and forth, you want that. Uh, capture your keyboard input. Um, which there's an option that if you are uh, doing some kind of a tutorial that you can have the keyboard data show up on your screen. So when you're recording, Camtasia will actually capture what you're doing on the keyboard and give you the ability to show that during your recording. Uh, disable the screensaver during capture, that's probably a good idea. Um, you don't want your computer just to go blank all of a sudden. Um, arrow, uh, that's just that little fancy Windows 7 stuff. Um, I don't mind it. If uh, you find that your videos are a little laggy, you can go ahead and turn the arrow off. Um, record to uh, CamRack is the extension, the default extension. Um, a temporary folder, pick a folder that uh, is easy to find. So I have a folder in my computer on my C drive called temp. So I'm just going to select temp so that if uh, let's say the computer quits halfway while you're producing your video or after you record the video something happens when it's saving it. You know where to look for to recover the files. So you don't um, lose that uh, recording. So click OK. Inputs. 
screen capture I believe 15 uh, frames a second is the default I'd leave it on that um, if you record at a higher frame rate uh, let's say now that would be a good idea if you're recording like uh, full motion videos you can see the webcam haha -ha. here I am anyway and uh, so uh, if you record less then the video gets really choppy if you record more then you get a much bigger video file uh, let's see video settings okay I just these are their defaults and I just leave them the audio settings again these are I believe the defaults and I just leave them okay and so you can see there's the webcam capture ooh isn't that exciting yes I'm in my family room notice how I use my cursor uh, with my mouse as a pointer when you produce your video you will notice that we will add um, cursor effects and we'll make the mouse uh, cursor a little bit bigger and we'll highlight it and we'll show left clicks and right clicks and also by having this mouse highlighted you can direct people to certain parts see like that here's the record button of the screen hotkeys I don't mess with hotkeys uh, I don't even mess with these recording regions um, and I just click OK so now we are ready to record you click the record button and notice when I hover over that you can see it says click to begin recording area within the dotted green border F9 is what you press to pause that's really good because if you're doing uh, recording on your own and you kinda run out of something to say and you're kinda thinking about it you can just hit the pause key gather your thoughts and then start up again you don't want to have to uh, try to do this all in one shot and then if it doesn't work out delete it and start over again it'll take you forever okay so we're ready to record press the record button uh, F10 stops the recording but use F9 to pause so now we're recording and now there's actually a Camtasia video recording as well. I want to show you a couple of samples of things you can do and how to use uh, Camtasia effectively. Um, I'm going to run a couple of demos for you. And uh, one demo is to run what's called, uh, I'm running a virtual server. It's called VirtualBox. Um, it's uh, open source, but Oracle uh, has purchased it, so I guess it's... Not quite, it's technically not open source, but well, they use an open source license, so I'm just going to open up VirtualBox and um, I am going to first run uh, Snow Leopard. Uh, this was a little bit trickier. Um, VirtualBox is designed to run the, the Mac uh, server but not the uh, retail version of Mac. Uh, I needed a couple little tweaks to do that. I'm going to start. And when I start, uh, you get a box. It tells you that uh, about capturing the keyboard and the mouse. I'll click OK. And now my virtual machine is starting. And so this is actually like a second computer on my computer and I will boot up to my virtual snow leopard and you can see the familiar apple okay and notice that it is starting up and it takes a little bit of time now one thing uh, about a virtual machine you say oh wow I can run uh, in Apple, like people run their Windows in uh, VMware on a Mac. Not really, because you can't allocate uh, a lot of resources to a particular virtual machine, so it runs a lot slower. Uh, I can't do video editing, uh, watching videos, 
in uh, on a virtual machine is, is usually not uh, really great and you can see now that it's starting to look like an apple so I click on that and now notice that the mouse belongs to my apple machine and if I do a control I believe it's a control F to get to full screen mode Oop, there we go so notice now it looks like a Macintosh an Apple uh, Mac uh, OS 7.6 no leopard um, now my virtual machine will only run in 1024 by 768 that's why you see the black lines along the edges see that's my Windows cursor that's my Apple cursor and notice the dock works pretty much the same um, one kind of cool thing is uh, I run Firefox in my virtual machine and you see a little bouncing and when Firefox opens what's really neat is the in Firefox there's a tool so you notice the lag this is a very busy page the College of Business home page so I click on tools there we go and I actually use the Firefox sync for the Firefox that sits within my virtual Snow Leopard machine and all my bookmarks and uh, my tabs are all um, synced from one computer to another so I have uh, and, and then they update so this uh, works just like um, anything else so I'm just going to go ahead and quit Firefox and I'm going to shut down my snow leopard one thing about this uh, virtual um, snow leopard is uh, I can't run updates. If I try to run updates, then my mouse stops working, so I don't run updates anymore. And if I scroll to the bottom of the page, that is the menu um, for my virtual machine. I'm going to control F to get out of full screen. And uh, control C. There we go and you can see my machine it's about to shut down and then I will just close it and I will send the power off machine and I will shut it down now I also have a Linux virtual machine um, by the way I've allowed uh, 60 gigs for my Snow Leopard but I only have about uh, 10 taken up so far I need to change my settings uh, because I want to increase the amount of RAM up to 4 gigs because I have 8 on this machine and I'm going to start my virtual Ubuntu machine I just like saying Ubuntu I think that's why I put it on there uh, this also runs in 1024 by 768 so that's why the machine looks a little stretched out and you'll see that if you're not familiar with Linux you'll see that it looks a lot like uh, Apple now you notice that I use my cursor to point things out and the cursor effects uh, you see the highlight I made my cursor a little bit bigger and uh, I use the left click and the right click um, effect the left click is a I believe a red ring and the right click is a blue ring and uh, in the how to produce the video I'll show you how to do those settings and to adjust the audio settings as well so notice my Ubuntu machine is running and you can see that the cursor is captured okay. you can actually get the Macintosh uh, the, the Apple 
background and put it on your Linux machine. And you notice things kind of start up slowly. Um, I loaded a dock on here that looks kind of like the Mac dock. And uh, so if we go again, I have Firefox on my Ubuntu machine. It is also an open source web browser. And I have not connected this one yet to my, uh, to sync with my other computers. Um, an interesting thing, uh, application here is um, there's an open source ERP system. So actually, I'm going to close Firefox. And I am going to my applications. And uh, I'm going to Office. And this is all very similar to uh, Microsoft Office. This is LibreOffice. Um, in other platforms, it's called OpenOffice. Let's just quit the virtual machine, and then let me get to show you. So notice I, I shut down Ubuntu within the virtual machine. And then it quits. And Ubuntu, unlike the uh, OS X, it actually will quit the virtual environment automatically. It's going to restore that. And you can see it shutting down there. So now, let's just do something, uh, for example, uh, you want to show somebody how to do something in oh, Access. Uh, let's take a look at a, a very small Access database. And Okay, so this is Microsoft Access, and uh, I'm going to create a little query. This is an um, assignment that uh, my students might do. And I'm going to sort the employees by first name and last name. We can see the tables. So here's my employee information and then my employee type. So first I'm going to sort by type name, then last name, then first name. So I'm going to go to my Create tab. And on the Create group, I'll do Query Design. Click that. And since my employee type name comes from the employee type table, I will select Employee Type. And I'll set Table Employee. So that's how we do that. And now, uh, so here's my query grid, also called a QBE grid. I can take my employee type name and click and drag. Or I could double click, last name, first name. And then I want to sort them in ascending order. And notice the, uh, before we do that, notice the link. It says that. An employee type occurs one time in the employee type table. That's the primary key. And that employee type ID occurs many times in the employee table because it's a foreign key. Okay, so that's just the primary key of one table. In another table, it's foreign in the other table. So, now we will sort in ascending order. And click Run. And there you go. It's in first alphabetically by employee type, then by last name, and then by first name. And that's just a little way that you can use access. Uh, and I don't want to save my query, so I'll quit. Now, I just want to show you a little bit another thing you can do. Um, if you have a tablet PC uh, or on the uh, Podium computers, you can use the uh, Symposium, and they might have an application. They might have Windows Journal or something similar to Windows Journal. Uh, I'm just going to use my window right key to snap it to the right side, and I'm going to write on it. So um, I just want to show you a little bit about um, that uh, REA. Um, enterprise ontology and how you can use it to teach uh, financial accounting. So, let me make this a little bigger. And so, let's take something like a sale.
So I'll write sale. And this is our cash receipt. These are two events. The sale, we give merchandise, so that's an economic decrement event. A cash receipt, we get cash. So that's an economic increment event. Now, if I wanted to query my database, for example, to get accounts receivable, uh, first we need to know, well, what is accounts receivable? So let's look at the account. Accounts receivable. Here's my debit side. That's where I increase. Here's my credit side. That's where I decrease. And so you can ask your students, well, what event causes accounts receivable to increase? And so, hopefully, eventually, you could get them to say uh, credit sales. So a sale actually gets accounts receivable to increase. So put sale. And what actually makes accounts receivable decrease? Well, those are cash receipts related to sales when we collect cash. So we could put cash receipts on this side. And so if I wanted to compute the accounts receivable balance, I could first, I'll sum up my sales. Second, I'll sum up my cash receipts. Then, third, my third query, I'll subtract the sum of my sales minus the sum of my cash receipts. And there you have it. You have just designed three queries to compute accounts receivable. And you notice that accounts receivable, if we do it in a journal entry, uh, let's forget about inventory for now. So we have a journal entry. We have debit accounts receivable for, let's say, $100. Credit sale, let's say, for $100. When we collect the cash, our cash increases by $100, and our accounts receivable decreases by $100. So really, when we have a sale that doesn't have a cash receipt, we, we increase accounts receivable because accounts receivable says, hey, I have a sale that does not yet have a cash receipt. And then when I collect the cash, I no longer need this placeholder called accounts receivable. So these two cancel out. So accounts receivable is simply an imbalance in this duality relationship. And that's all that's to it. We could talk about unearned revenue in the same way. Unearned revenue is also a placeholder. Because if uh, I have unearned revenue, it's simply I collect the cash before the sale. So here's my unearned revenue. Decreases with debits and increases with credits. When I collect cash... I increase unearned revenue. That's cash collected relative to uh, for services to be delivered at a later time. And then when I actually provide the goods or services, my sale actually decreases my unearned revenue. So if I wanted to query to get unearned revenue, first I'll sum up my cash receipts that will be related to, well, we don't have the sale yet, but we would have a sale order. So I would sum up my cash receipts that are related to sale orders, but not yet related to sales. Then I would sum up all my sales and unearned revenue is the sum of those cash receipts related to the sale orders but not sales minus the sum of the sales and that's unearned revenue so unearned revenue is a placeholder 
So cash goes up 100, unearned revenue goes up 100. Then when I uh, earn the cash, when I earn the money, then my sale goes up. Oops, that's supposed to be credit. Then my uh, sale goes up by 100, and my unearned revenue decreases by 100. And again, notice that unearned revenue is simply a placeholder that says, I have received cash that I have not yet earned. And that's all that's to it. So now, you've seen some different ways that you can use Camtasia to do a recording. And the next part of the video will show you how to actually produce it.